Today's presenter, Russell Jackman, is a graduate of the McGeorge School of Law, University of Pacific, and was admitted to the State Bar of California in June of 1994. He has been vice chair of the California State Bar's Law Practice Management and Technology Committee and a member since 1996. He works specifically with law offices and attorneys that need to get the most out of their legal technology and creates PowerPoint presentations for opening statements, direct examinations, and closing statements to be used in court and can work with attorneys directly to filter their documents and images so that they have the most powerful visual presentations possible. He also works with law offices and solo attorneys to upgrade their older systems to new ones, troubleshooting existing setups and training attorneys and staff on Microsoft programs. He is available for remote access consulting on technology related issues so please feel free to contact him at any time. Hello, my name is Russell Jackman, and today we're gonna to be talking about going paperless, a, now in the year 2020. Um, uh, and this is a talk for the Center of Continuing Education. Really appreciate you taking the time out to listen to this lecture today, because it's, it's a very important lecture. I um, don't normally like to uh, uh, freeze these talks in time, but at the moment that I'm, I'm recording this, uh, we're going through the coronavirus uh, quarantine that's happening. And it's uh, sort of put us in, in a different spot where a lot of people now are working from home. Um, they are trying to actually indeed go paperless, and find a way to uh, be able to work electronically. So it's sort of a, a bigger topic that's of mind, um, even at this very moment. Um, as it was when I originally gave this lecture back in, in 2011. So paper is on its way out in everyday business. Time for the legal profession to follow. And I put that in a black and white slide right at the beginning, or, you know, nice, clear lettering so people can understand this. Because I think that the, the general attitude of most law offices and most attorneys to resist this statement and to come up with excuses why they still need to use paper for everything they do. Now, certainly there are parts of our profession where having the actual physical piece of paper and the physical signature is still very important. For things like wills and, and so forth and contracts and things like that. Having the ink signature is very important, but it's still not the there's so much paper that goes through a law office, so much uh, needless uh, printing that's done um, and duplication of items. Um, so that it's really a, 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 still a crisis of paper being used so much in the modern law office that it really has to start. Uh, uh, 2020 isn't the right time people to understand that it's time to go paperless, then I'm not sure when there's going to be time that people are going to realize paperless is the only way to go right now for uh, the vast majority of the work that you do in law. And so um, to that extent, here's just some basic ideas of what, what we're talking about when we talk about producing paper use in law. Uh, if you are using paper, you're going to want it to go with double sided printing, duplex printing. A lot of printers have that ability to be able to do that. There's no reason for you to have an extra, uh, you know, having stuff one, one uh, page per document. In fact, I think most court documents now are requiring people to uh, print them in double side, sided print when they submit it in paper. Um, you can widen the margins and lower the front font size, make things fit on maybe one page that would normally be going on to two pages. Um, you know, you don't want to lower the font size to, you know, less than six, but I do know a lot of people that have font sizes that are 14 or 16 and could definitely uh, make their printing uh, significantly smaller down to 10, still quite legible. 
um, or even eight to the most part, um, and still uh, reduce their their paper the font size in half, and thereby reducing also paper uh, you know printouts by almost that much. Um, it's always a great idea to make yourself a scrap paper notebook. So when you do have printouts that don't you know work correctly or 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 you know that you need to reprint it again. Make sure you recycle that paper, cut it up, make them into your own post-it notes, that kind of thing. Um, and really, you know, I know this goes without saying, but you should really think before you print something out. If it's really, I, I still see attorneys that will print something out, edit it with a pen, make their notes and 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 whatever on a printed document, and then retype those corrections back into the document itself. And is that really, not only are they duplicating their effort and making it much longer process to actually edit that document and to get their editing done correctly, but they're obviously wasting paper because there's no reason to have that printed out. You should really find a way to edit as much as you can and use things like digital comments and other features that are built into the review part of Word or, 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 or Excel so that you're not winding up printing out a lot of things over and over again. And um, printing to edit is just an old school habit that needs to be basically gotten rid of. You need to really be considering how you edit stuff on the, sc on the screen itself um, without having to look at it in print. I know a lot of people are trained the other way, but I think that's really important for people to, to get that down, to get that skill down. Because if you print it only once, then you're going to wind up saving yourself a lot in paper. And so that is point number five. Is that, um, Also, the fact is, when you're making those changes, on the, when you print it out and then you write your changes down, there's a chance that you'll still make a mistake when re-entering in those changes into the electronic document itself after you've already printed it out and marked it up. You may miss it, you may um, dispel something and, and just not get the, the, uh, the, the idea correct when you write it down on paper, then translate it back in, and it makes it hard for other people to follow. So you can work so much better collaboratively if you learn to make those changes and corrections on your documents themselves instead of uh, 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 you know, printing them out and then making the changes later. Um, I make a tremendous habit of reusing the envelopes and packages and boxes um, with blank labels to, you know, make sure that I don't keep uh, 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 having to reprint envelopes or, or packages and stuff like that. It, it's always a great way to save on uh, shipping costs. And then um, you can cut up old scrap paper and, and News, using newspapers or your own uh, uh, actual, you know, uh, scrap paper reservoir, if you, you know, used up everything for note paper or whatever, you cut that all up and use that as packing material. It's much better than using uh, styrofoam packing peanuts, which are hopefully going to be outlawed in every area soon. Um, here's some more ideas. Don't get on the don't mail list and reduce the catalog number. So making sure that, that you're not getting as much junk mail. And I know it's a challenging thing, but there are ways that you can get on those uh, don't mail lists, the unsubscribe lists, and try to reduce that amount of paper that's coming in. And then, um, you know, try to switch, if you can, any mail newsletters, if you're still getting them, the online version. Um, if you're still using faxes on the, the computer, um, you can use certain services like eFax that will allow you to have faxing capabilities, electronic faxing capabilities, still use fax machines. So um, people, they, you, you can buy yourself a fax number. It still has the, the ability to communicate with fax machines, it's a phone number, but when it faxes to you, when instead of it coming in on your machine as a fax, will then go to your computer as an email attachment. And that's actually very helpful um, 
and you can also send out from your computer to a fax number a a, a fax and some there are still some places that use faxes for security for uh for unhackability and for uh, insurance reasons and so if you're going to be doing a lot of that instead of printing something out and putting it in the fax machine then you go through the fax machine and then god sakes a lot of fax machines print out a receipt after they're done so those fax machines can be very paper intensive you can skip all of that and generate most of those things directly from your computer and still send it to the old-fashioned fax machines if they need it um so get used to using a scan signature and insert them into your word document um so the entire document can be sent instead of printed then signed then scanned back in i see so many law offices that are doing the old-fashioned signing on printing out an entire document signing one page then scanning that entire document back in then throwing out or shredding the document that they just signed and it doesn't seem to make that much sense if you can get used to digital signatures you can do them through adobe acrobat um if you have the commercial acrobat program um and there's other document signing services like DocuSign and eSign and other companies that you can get an account with that will let you verify your signature with them without having to print the, the item out, scan it, and then, uh, uh, and then um, fax it or, 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 or uh, email it as a scan uh, back to the uh, person that you wanted the signature to. Um, as I said, I've like just scanned my uh, signature in the signature block. And then what I do is I just uh, insert it as a picture into my document. I, you know, make the size correct. And then really for most, the most part, since it is your signature, unless you yourself are gonna, gonna say that it's a forgery or somebody else is gonna claim it's a forgery, for the most part, that signature is gonna work. Most people never have a problem with it. It's the easy way to start digital and stay digital, which has always been my mind. Um, and then it's better if you can use electronic banking and computerized accounting system rather than paper. Um, I'm sure most of you are using those by now, but there's still some holdouts. Um, and then again, people like will type up an entire Excel spreadsheet and then print it out and then send the print out to their account. Why not just stay um, digital the entire time? And then you can use sticky notes that are built into Windows or Outlook instead of uh, post-it notes. And then you have them on your computer and you also have an electronic record of those um, documents and when you made those sticky notes and who made those sticky notes. I've always found those uh, functions to be a lot computerized note keeping to be more effective than having write sticky notes that get lost and are easy to misinterpret or mishandle so you know where they get stuck on the bottom of your shoe and you never find it and then um you really need to use your scanner on a regular basis and you need to if you are using a lot of scanning you know personally like let's say at your desktop you know and you're, you're getting a lot of information then it may not be good to have just one giant scanner in the middle of the office, you know, the, the, the muscle printer that you have. And yes, it can scan. Yes, it can do bulk scanning. But if you're going to have to walk, um, you know, halfway across your office every time you want to scan something, maybe it's worth it to get a scanner, your own personal scanner for your desk. So um, uh, I see a lot of people that like the Fujitsu Scan Snap. Um, scanner, which is a small box scanner. It, it does uh, sheet feeding. It doesn't do flatbed scanning. So you can't really do stuff that comes out of books very easily or that's in binders or without taking them out or cutting a piece of paper out. But Or odd-sized documents doesn't work really well with. But it does do a great job with standard pieces of paper. And you just put them into the, the, the uh, scanner. You just press a button. It turns them into PDFs or JPEGs, whatever sort of image file you want. Then 
um, you can use that as a way to quickly scan everything that comes into you um, when it's in paper form, make it a habit so that uh, you get, because if, I think a lot of people skip scanning because it's either too complicated because you have to go over to a machine that's in the center of the office and then you have to put in your email address or you have to uh, type in your office IP number and it can and it requires programming and that sort of thing. Um, you'll find that these Fujitsu or or a scan snap um, Xerox also has one it just you can um, have at your desk you just is so much faster and easier especially when it's not a really large bulk document and it's not trying to get out to the entire office you just need it for one particular workstation um, I think that's a great great purchase and almost every attorney I know that has one secretary that I know that has one or paralegal that I know has one uses it and appreciates its value and convenience. So here's some scanning tips for you. Um, a lot of people not really aware of what makes good resolution for scanning. Um, usually 150 DPI for text, 300 for pictures. And people say, well, you know what? I want to have the best scan possible. So I'm going to do everything in 1200 DPI. Well, there's a problem with that. And that is if you do every page in 1200 DPI, you're going to wind up with a document. Let's say you're doing 100 pages. That document is going to be several hundred megs in size because the higher DPI dots per inch you scan something in, the more it takes up in memory space on your computer. So for pictures, 300 DPI is pretty good. And you'll get the ability to zoom in on the picture and you'll get good picture density. And maybe if it's something that you're going to use in court, you may even up that 300 to, to 600 or 1200 DPI. But for hundreds of pages of text, you want something around 150 or maybe even 100 DPI because text doesn't really change that much. If it's a nice, clear image that you're you're scanning 150 dpi is plenty dots per inch to determine what the text looks like even if you zoom it up on a big screen for people to be able to read without taking as much memory space because the other thing too is that the more dpi that you're scanning something in the longer it's going to take the slower the scanner runs so if you can if you get good resolution at 150 or even 100 dpi you'll find that the scan is going to take one third the time that a 300 DPI setting would be on and almost, you know, 90% less time than if you put it on 1200 or 1500 or 1600 DPI. So um, just don't kick up the DV because I, I worked once with an attorney that insisted that everything be done in 1200 DPI and he had hundreds of documents in his, uh, uh, presentation and it basically overloaded his computer's memory and caused his computer to crash every time he wanted to load up that PowerPoint because it was like a four gig PowerPoint as far as you know how big it was it just overwhelmed the memory of the machine so keep the, that in mind especially if you're going to be using these documents um, in any kind of collaborative work or PowerPoints or presentations that kind of thing that when you can go with a smaller document size, you're going to wind up getting a, a, a better performance when you try to use it um, as a display sort of thing. And you don't want to underdo it. You don't want the pictures to look blurry or, or, or fuzzy when you put them up there. So don't pick a super low resolution for everything. Discern whether you're going to be doing pictures or whether you're going to be doing text. So that saves room on your hard drive. And then you don't want to use PDFs for everything. Um, there are certainly times where you can use um, just standard JPEG, or you can use um, uh, different settings. So like a, a TIFF image, um, because those use up a lot less space. PDFs generally hog a lot of, of room on your hard drive. And there's a lot of things, especially pictures, that are easier to use in documents and in say PowerPoints, for instance, you have the picture 
as a JPEG or GIF for a t single file, TIFF file, than it is, or even a bitmap, than it is if you use a PDF. Because uh, you'll sometimes lose resolution when you use a, a P, when you save a picture in as a PDF. You have less control over it when it's in a PDF form, and then you have to open up Adobe Acrobat, get the picture out of the PDF by either exporting it or by taking a screenshot and then pasting it into, say, Word or, or, or PowerPoint. That's just extra steps. You have those items already as JPEGs, already as graphic uh, images, GIFs, or TIFFs, and it winds up getting into these other uh, presentations and these other formats much easier. Um, and it's also easier to send JPEGs. Let's say you have a PDF and it's got 150 pages in it. You just want to release one page. Well, if you have the JPEGs page by page for discovery, you can just go ahead and send them one JPEG, uh, you know, a single JPEG. Whereas you have to get one page out of discovery for um, a PDF, that takes more work. Um, and then you know, and this is true. I wrote this in 2011, and it's true today. Adobe's constant updates are a pain, and they are. It's just, I'm not a big fan of using Adobe Acrobat for everything in the world because I'm not really a huge fan of the Acrobat program. I mean, it's a necessary evil, gotta have it. It's so many documents are in PDF format, but the uh, Adobe Acrobat program isn't the world's easiest program to get along with sometimes. Um, and then, as I said before, invest in a fast scanner because the money is worth it. So when you have a fast scanner, and you're, if you have a slow scanner, you know you got the one hundred dollar special from uh, Best Buy. I mean, you can still use it, but if you're using it all the time and it can't do more than one page a minute, you think to yourself, "Oh, one page a minute, that's no problem." But then a hundred page document is going to take you an hour and a half to scan. You know, over an hour and a half to scan. And that's obviously crazy because I know attorneys that sometimes have to scan, you know, a thousand pages. And you don't want to have to sit your scan up for, you know, a week, scan something like that. You know, what if you have a scanner that's powerful enough to do, say, a thousand pages in office, you'll probably find that the money that you spend on that scanner, especially if it's fast, you know, so you can do one or two pages really quickly is going to be worth it over the long run. So we've now gotten to the point, especially where we are with the uh, coronavirus crisis, that email is the world's largest communication tool. And I was just looking at like the trends because I have done this lecture over a number of years. And, and it seemed pretty amazing when you said that 3.3 trillion US email messages were transmitted in 2002. And then that, equaled 9.1 billion messages per day, okay? This is in 2002. In 2003, 31 billion emails were being sent daily. We know where we are in 2000, well, not we don't have the numbers for 2020, but the most recent numeric data I could get is in 2018, 124.5 billion business emails were sent and received each day. So that's, that's about 111.1 billion consumer emails sent and received. That means that e the average office worker receives 121 emails per day, per day. That really, to me, this was a stunning number. And, you know, the, when we wrote that, you know, 3.3 trillion U.S. email messages transmitted in 2002, we're talking... 124 billion bis business emails. And this doesn't even cover all the items such as personal messages, texts, and so forth that have sort of supplanted email. Email is somewhat of an old fashioned concept now. I mean, people are, are, are talking to each other through Slack, they're talking to each other through Facebook, they're talking to each other through Twitter, they're talking to each other through Instagram so forth so i'm not even i'm not even sure it's easily able to i wouldn't be surprised 
it's like the 9.1 billion messages per day that they had in 2002. If now in 2020, we were over 10 times that amount. And now with everyone being stuck in the coronavirus, this is about the only way that they're able to communicate because nobody can communicate now face to face uh, and may not be able to for the next several months. So, so email is really, and, and the other ways of communicating through messages become you know synonymous how we do business and probably going to be that way forever um now one thing that's also important is that when you are involved in going digital you make the ability for electronic discovery to work so much more effectively um the speed of the uh, of data aggregation and using search tools find what you're looking for gives you that immediate efficiency you can find the right information within aggressive discovery deadlines which is really get be, those deadlines are tightening up and tightening up and tightening up every year um, the accuracy of being able to search through millions of electronic documents to find the relevant information filtering out unrelated types of files such as program and system files and re and deduplicate redundant files that's a very important element to any sort of discovery program that you're working with is that you're not going through duplicate results um, and being able to just filter it down to specifically what you're looking for and and being able to to do that without needing a heavy amount of, of programming knowledge or, or awkwardness through really byzantine commands sub-menus and that sort of thing. That's what people are usually looking for when they're trying to set up their electronic discovery system. And then it's, it's staying in paper costs so much money when it comes to how discovery works. Um, by doing um, uh, uh, things through electronic means, you gain much better control over discovery costs and you reduce the need for increased internal Internet information technology, staffing, training, and hardware. And then you get the additional benefits of being able to outsource electronic discovery risk. Um, and then uh, 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 if, you, if you keep it in-house, you're able to not have to worry so much about authenticity, chain of custody, and that sort of thing. Um, and then you can continuously access state-of-the-art electronic discovery services Externally, if that's something that you, you know, once you have all the data in a digital format, you decide, okay, I do want to now outsource it. Getting it out to them becomes so much easier. You can send them, you know, a bunch of uh, CDs or a hard drive or, you know, uh, uh, send it to them by a secured uh, um, Dropbox or box or Google Drive, that sort of thing. Once you have it electronic, you can do something with it. If you don't have it electronic, then there's very little you can do with it, you know, and you're kind of stuck with no opportunity to be able to move it anywhere else. If it's just in paper, your options are severely limited. When you have it electronic, the things you can do with it are almost unlimited. So that's why. Um, electronic discovery is really when it used to seem like a luxury for only the biggest cases. Now in 2020, we're seeing that electronic discovery is the rule, not the exception for how data is handled. And of course, you want to, uh, when we talk about um, paper review versus electronic review, um, we are talking about um, OCR to recover text, and that's optical uh, uh, character recognition of paper. It's about 85 to 95% accurate. The only problem is that when you talk, you know, about thousands and thousands of words, um, you don't always get the perfect translation, even with a clean document that was printed out in rather, you know, uh, clean format. It just, depending on the software that you use, it 
it's just going to miss some words and it still needs to be reviewed. It's better than typing the entire document back out by hand. But the way that optical char character recognition works is the computer goes and looks at each item that's on the screen. So like the word memo looks at the, at the letter M, takes a snapshot of it, and then it goes through a graphical database inside the computer and says this shape that it's looking at what does it look most to me like the computer asks well given my library of shapes that really looks like an m so i'm going to turn it into an m and then it looks at the e says that looks like a lowercase e and then it says i'm going to make it into a text version of an e and you'd say, well, gosh, that should take forever. But the computer does it so quickly. It really does do these optical, and it's getting faster and faster now. OCRing is getting faster and getting better at, at doing things. If you've ever deposited your check over at you know, uh, the bank, have it scan your check and be able to actually recognize people's horrible handwriting um, to still be able to know that something, the difference between hundred dollars and a thousand dollars you can see that those things are better but every so often you do have to go to the, to, uh, the keypad and fix the uh what what didn't get ocr correctly and that's kind of the bottom line is that no matter how good ocr is you have to still review it you still have to go over it make sure that everything got in correctly you know that everything that was uh, 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 scanned, got OCR'd in the correct format. And that does take time, it does take energy. It's a lot better than having to retype a document again, especially we're still seeing OCRing done for really old texts. There still are you know, old texts, old cases, old agreements and so forth that, that are not um, uh, in a digital format. And, those are, you know, uh, over time getting translated uh, into a digital format. So you can edit with uh, a Word doc, a Word or, or another text editor, um, or, you know, you copy and paste into an email or something like that. So, so OCR is still around and it's still doing its thing. It's getting better and it's, it's, it's in a pretty good spot, but it's not something you can rely on 100%. You still have to review it to make sure that it's um, because you need electronic discovery because corporate data can often be invisible and it can involve large quantities of data, numerate disparate, dis disparate and, and incompatible file types. So you have to sometimes dig through a lot of different file opening programs to be able to open certain corporate data. And sometimes they have proprietary programs that they themselves have written that have the data encoded in such a way that if you don't have that company's program to open it, you won't be able to view that data at all. So sometimes when you're trying to do discovery, you'll need to make sure that you uh, uh, put out for discovery the idea that you're able to um, you know, the program itself that opened or created those files because just getting the data files sometimes isn't enough for you to be able to open it and use it. Um, and then this is a significant problem. Data files can reside on many different hard drives, and corporate servers, not just in one location, but sometimes internationally. So being able to master your electronic discovery um, strategy is really important because if you're looking for discovery and you're not thinking about the data files that might be on other hard drives, again, on other servers and in other countries, um, you may be missing out some key evidence. Um, some files exist live, you know, on hard drives and servers. So in other words, you don't subpoena things or look for discovery on hard, a hard drive that's being active right now, 
you may not see the file. I mean, people are so used to when something is printed by that very nature, as soon as it's printed, it's done being an active document. And it's not being changed, it's not being used except people can read it, but it can't be altered in a format, you know, without you know, somebody eating with their paper or something like that. Whereas the ones that are online can be edited at any time. And um, uh, so you have to be aware of that. And, and when you're subpoenaing certain documents, you have to make sure that you're getting the specific version that you're looking for or that you're getting the latest version you're looking for. Um, and being able to uh, know that you're working with the specific document that you're looking for, not just one that you know maybe was was edited today or edited last week. Um, then you have to look at the strategy of the fact that other files lie dormant on backup and archive page. So, you know, backup drives, thumb drives, phones, even with their own internal storage and have that information on it. You need to go and look for that too, because if you, again, it used to be one piece of paper is what you were looking for. But now this data, because it's not physical, can exist in so many different locations. You have to wrap your mind around the fact that, okay, maybe they say it's not available, they don't see it, they don't find it, they somebody deleted it, but is it available on a backup somewhere? Somebody you can sometimes recover attachments, for instance, uh, email attachments from a server that's not not internal. So for instance, the mail server that is hired by another company um, that isn't run by the company itself, they may have copies of the documents that you're looking for, or that the other side says that um, became deleted or, or, or they couldn't find. Um, so that has to be part of your strategy too. And you have to keep that in mind when people are looking to discover things from your client. Bottom line is that electronic evidence in native environments cannot be viewed or analyzed in one part of one time. Accessible, it must have to be collected and then prepared. We're going to talk a little bit about the legal authority supporting modern discovery practice. Um, we now have for sure that federal and state courts backing the use of automated discovery methods. In fact, one judge said back in 2001, uh, what alternative is there? Well, pens, it's, it's pretty much now given uh, for most courts that they are looking to see we've got digital version of, of, of something and that, that using electronic evidence is not unusual or, or out of the ordinary for any law office to use um, or any attorney to use when, when, when giving especially large amounts of data back and forth, both to the court and to opposing counsel. And then um, it's uh, the, the Zubalaki um, decision, 2004, has been talked about quite often, which is that it, it stated that there's no dirty duty to preserve every shred of paper, every email or electronic document, every backup tape, such because such a rule would cripple large corporations. And they, they uh, created what was known as a uh, balancing test, in Rule 26F uh, of the federal rule, saying that you, you need to balance the competing needs to preserve relevant evidence and to continue routine operations critical to ongoing activities, complete or broad cessation of parties' routine computer operations, to paralyze the party's activities. So the, the, the bottom line of the, that Zubalaki decision is that if it makes sense for people to go through and turn something into an electronic version so that they can not have to keep every piece of paper around um, and they do it as part of a routine and a regular part of business, then you will wind up having a much more effective uh, operations of, of business itself. And it's sort of, this came out in 2004 when, when um, there were not a lot of ability for scanning as much as there is now. 
and more and more documents now have been created electronically. So we're seeing that, that, that um, while storage has increased, and that is another, another element too, is that what was hard to store back in 2004 is now actually much easier to store. I mean, you can go down to Best Buy right now, buy yourself a four terabyte hard drive. And that holds a lot of information. Four terabytes is a significant amount of data. Um, uh, and most people on their own computers at home have over a one terabyte drive or two terabyte drives in their home system. I definitely have one myself, it's two terabytes and, and one terabyte is already used up. So, so um, uh, data, especially as time moves on, takes up more room, we, we, we make more room to store it and then we use up more room on it once we have that room to store all that. So it sort of kind of goes around in somewhat of a circle. Um, here is the federal rule 30B6. It's a uh, federal rule of civil procedure 30B6. And um, it's pretty much the one that, that is the, the one in charge when it comes to um, uh, discovery and, and whether or not and uh, how it should be provided. And that is uh, when a party may in the party's notice the subpoena name as proponent in public or private or associate described with reasonably particularity on the matters in which the examination is requested. Okay. So once the data is specifically requested, you can provide it in that electronic format and not have to provide it in paper um, because you're providing the information that was with reasonable particularity on the matter of which the examination is requested. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that they're looking at what they're, they want and just because it's electronic versus a piece of paper, unless the authenticity is being brought into question about what is on a piece of paper, it's going to be fine under the federal rules of civil procedure. And all you really need is a person there's a person so designated shall testify as to matters known or reasonably available to this organization. So you just have to have somebody testify that what they're looking at electronically is what they were looking at in print. And that's pretty much all you need to do to justify um, uh, electronic discovery over paper discovery under federal civil procedure 30B6. And then there's also Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 33 about um, uh, intero the interrogatories being used to prepare for IT personnel depositions. And uh, you can use uh, Civil Procedure 30B6 to uh, depose IT personnel responsible for data storage, indexing, archiving, backups, computer setup, the operating system and software use, access codes, passwords, network growth, maintenance, et cetera. So uh, 30B6 is a pretty important rule to work with if you want to get to the root of uh, the uh, company's IT persons and what they know and, and what you need to know to be able to get the data that you're looking for. Um, and also, uh, preservation of evidence is now an entirely different ballgame. So if you have uh, failure to back up data or otherwise preserve evidence, um, that's inexcusable conduct. And uh, they courts have ordered um, under civil discovery standard 29A III that, that um, if they find that another party has intentionally destroy that information or erase that information, they will, they can't order the reconstruction of scratch of lost data. So that means that information has to either be re-entered in by hand um, or recompiled by hand and then still brought in um, if uh, they feel that that sort of data destruction was malicious. And the document is now anything that conveys information. It doesn't have to be piece of paper or, or something written in stone um, or a microfiche record. 
It now means a note on a phone, an email, a spreadsheet, a database record, anything that is uh, uh, that conveys information is basically considered a document. So that's important to know. Um, and then spoliation is a huge issue. So um, they have, is for, since the early 90s, they've been saying that if you are in charge of destroying or if another party is in charge of destroying that information intentionally, they will decide on not only sanctions, but they will also say that, that they can give a spoliation inference saying that whatever was assumed by the other party in your document will be considered true because that you destroyed it and you destroyed it on purpose. Therefore, what the other side is saying about you must be correct. Um, and they've also led to sanctions and um, costs when um, failure of attorneys to halt routine destruction of archival data relevant to pending litigation. So if you know that, I mean, it's easy. That, that's one of the, the, the difficulties of electronic information is that it's easy to store but it's also easy to destroy and, and get rid of. And so you don't always want to keep it around. You don't want to keep stuff around forever, but you also want to make sure that you uh, don't just, you know, uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater and, and get rid of important evidence that is necessary for uh, litigation. So I mean, any, anything that looks like it might be subjected to, um, litigation needs to be uh, kept safe and made sure that it doesn't get get routinely destroyed or else that spoliation inference can be uh, quite damaging. Um, so with, with paper, um, they talk about uh, uh, what is kept in the regular course of business um, to falls within the purview of the discovery request. And another question is, is who pays for this and often the, there's a showing of need for a cost sharing scheme. So they, the court will say, how important is it for this company to, uh, for, for the plaintiff to uh, get this information and what means do they have to obtain that versus how much does it cost the defendant to provide this information? What is their ability to provide that? So, they can sometimes see a, a larger, uh, more well-heeled plaintiff will maybe take a greater share of the costs on something of, of getting discovery, whereas um, a defendant that is a big company sometimes will be burdened with a larger amount to provide that information, you know, and they'll have to pay more to provide that information than the plaintiff. It's a small plaintiff and a, and a big defendant and the big defendant usually pays more to provide that. And if it's a large plaintiff and a small defendant, the plaintiff will usually pay more to get that information. So just some, some mind-boggling concepts of how storage capacity has changed so much. And so when you think about pages per megabyte, that's about 50. Then you think about then per one, how many uh, megabytes per gigabyte would be, you know, 1,000. 24. So back when you had the floppy drives, those were 1.4 megs. So they probably fit, oh, probably about, you know, a couple hundred pages on a floppy drive. And then we started moving from, from to memory sticks that held from one gig to now one terabyte. And that's really amazing because they're only the size of your thumb. Then we had zip drives for a while that had 100 to 250 megs. Moved from that to CD-ROMs that held 700 megs. And then DVDs started holding 4.7, 8.5 gigs. Then we had a digital tape that held 35 to 35 gigs. And super digital tapes that held 110 gigs. But now we have hard drives that are holding one to six terabytes. And in fact, um, uh, uh, on top of the the hard drives themselves, we've now had the uh, solid state hard drives, which are basically like memory sticks. Um, uh, and they can hold in that one to six terabyte uh, 
level of information, but they can hold it indefinitely because there's no moving parts and they're completely solid state. Um, and then, of course, you have backup servers that are international and they're basically unlimited when it comes to how you know the cloud works and cloud storage. Um, and they share it between so many different computers that literally the amount of information. Can be. So this is also, you know, uh, attorneys tend to think in terms of banker box. So um, if you have one box, that's usually around 2,500 pages. And that usually turns into about a 50 megabyte. Um, if you look at like one banker's box, about 50 megabytes. But then you get when you get in the, the couple hundred banker box range, you're into the gigabyte. Then when you talk in like 10,000, 20,000, something like that, banker boxes, you're in the terabyte level. And you know, you're talking like really, like in some situations, basically, you're you're talking one hard drive, like say a one or two terabyte hard drive, it's holding the equivalent. 40,000 banker boxes or like basically like a warehouse. So a typical PC hard drive has between maybe 50 to 100 gigabytes worth of information on. I mean, it's usually the, the hard drive itself has more capacity than 100 gigabytes, you know, usually in a couple of terabyte area. But if you really boil it down to it, typically, most law offices have about 50 to 100 gigs worth of actual information on it. That still is in the 2,000 to 5,000 banker boxes worth of information on it. And so you are really thinking, when you think about like 2,000 banker boxes worth of data, that's actually pretty overwhelming. So it's people like just throw these numbers around, but if they thought, how much physical data it would actually take up, physical space would take up to house all this data if it were all printed on pieces of paper. It would be, everyone would have giant warehouses full of, uh, of paper uh, representing what was on a typical hard drive. And when you have a typical server, that's in the you know, 500 gig range to a terabyte range, which is you know, around 10,000 to 20,000 Anchor boxes and even more, you know, maybe even these days, a typical server is more like in the 60,000 to, to 100,000 banker boxes worth of, of paper. It's just an overwhelming, you can't even comprehend now physically how much paper it would take to replicate like a standard hard drive, but what data is on it. That's the bottom line of this chart. So, traditional discovery project versus process based. I want to quickly go through this, this chart here. It's just how all of it is done. Traditional e-discovery is slow, disruptive, and very expensive because it would take understanding the data itself and it's not repeatable. So you have to manually acquire an enormous amount of data. Then you have to extract and process the data. And then you have to do a legal analysis and review of it. Then you have to present what your findings are, and then finally, you package all that together to produce a document. Um, the attorney review is uh, when you over collect data, then you're in a big problem because the attorney review of it, having to sort out and get rid of the data you don't need is winds up being very expensive. Um, so it makes sense that you have electronic data discovery programs that work with email, electronic documents, and that they get what's known as metadata, not the uh, Will Rogers, I never metadata, I didn't like. That. In parody of, this, I never met a man I didn't like, but revealing data, metadata can find that important information, such as the author, modification times, and when an item was received, opened, or accessed. It can work with much larger volume without taking up much space. So searching, copying, and transferring and producing from outside sources, again, becomes a lot easier when you go and you look at the metadata that you can provide for each document. So from paper production, what you see is what you get. But with you get no metadata in a printed document or, say, 
something that was made like say as a PDF or or you know a lockdown PDF or or say a JPEG image. Fine. You can discover what's more on that document. Say you're able to open up a file in Word. You can get things like when the document was created, when it was printed, who edited it, how many times it was edited, who, uh, who, how much time was spent on the document. Um, and that metadata, even though you don't see it and it's invisible, can be really important sometimes to uh, certain claims or issues that uh, come up uh, uh, when people are, are talking about that particular document. And also, there's a lot of metadata that can be found in email too. So just because you see something on screen doesn't mean there isn't stuff behind it. It's gonna give you information like when the email was opened, who received it, and the sender and receiver email boxes, and how you find those. That can also verify that you know certain people opened it at certain times. And is that actually that person who did it? Um, and then word tracking and you can get so a lot of times people will forget to turn off their tracking or clear out their tracking when they send it to another party a word document to another party if you can turn that tracking back on sometimes you can find out that they wrote certain things before they deleted them it can be kind of incriminating for instance you know, she finds out how far we are behind on the new contract they may cancel us well that was deleted but they forgot to clear that deletion out. And so um, this person was able to discover that. Um, same thing with a printed spreadsheet. If it's printed, then people will know they only see what they what what's there in the printing. But if you uh, go and check out, there can be hidden formulas, hidden rows, and even hidden sheets that explain more than what what meets the eye. You can get a lot more of a uh, of a definition as to what you're exactly looking for. You might be able might reveal some interesting stuff. So the bottom line is that you want to always get a file in its source, its electronic source. You don't want someone to print out a spreadsheet and hand it to you. You want to get the spreadsheet file itself. You don't want them to hand the word or print out the word document, hand it to you or scan it to you. You want to uh, get subpoena the Word document itself. And so the electronic pro discovery process defined here is that you're, you're talking about targeting e-data and word processing documents, you're talking about email messages and attachments, you're talking about graphic images, and you're talking about spreadsheets. You wanna, you wanna make all of those items things that you're looking for to discover because if you don't have a comprehensive uh, paperless document discovery plan, you're going to miss something. You don't want to miss something. That's important. Um, plus, other data that's created and stored on computers and networks, it's important to cover. And um, you just got to make an you have to keep in mind that you know the input devices such as scanners, OCR, coding, EDD processing is all part of your plan. That you're, you're, when you put together a discovery, that you're, you're first working with scanners to turn uh, documents that aren't already electronic into something that's electronic. Then you have your OCR program that you're working with set up and you're familiar with, and that scans and is a, take scanned images and turn them into workable, editable, and readable documents. Then you want to have coding set up so that you can have those OCR documents um, in your database and definable and findable and indexed and that sort of thing. And then your EDD processing is something that you use as an envelope, your entire umbrella term, so that you then put it all together and have it in a format that you can use either in court or in negotiations, organized in a way that you know what's there and you're able to, to bring it to the surface much more effectively um, than just sort of rambling around and saying, well, we've got some images here, 
We've got some documents there. I know we have some things on some metadata over here, but we also have um, uh, some things indexed over there. If you have it all coordinated and say, in this case, here's where everything is. Here's where the images are. Here are the key documents. Here are the key parts of the key documents. That we want. And then here are things that maybe we still need to add. We need to make sure that we discover so that, or, or, or things that have been maybe destroyed or things that weren't provided from the other side so that we can you know, also bring that up to court and make sure that, that people are fully aware that you know, maybe we didn't bring this up or we didn't talk about it because the other side didn't provide us with the evidence was necessary for us to be able to, to fully discover what was going on in this case. I mean, it's all gonna depend on the case itself and, and, and what sort of evidence you're looking at. Um, so you want, the process is, again, you start with data collection, then data preparation and processing, then you review it, then you produce it. So here's another um, graphic that's just showing, you start with the customer data, you then go through a file in inventory, you number it, look at the file signature, look at the file fingerprinting, then you unzip and decompress it, you extract any emails that are related to it, you deduplicate as we talked about, because you don't want to have to work with too much information, convert and render it, and then you finally index it and then publish it when, when it goes through data preparation. And um, you want to make sure that live data is collected, that forensic data is being collected, and that you maintain data integrity and authenticity so that the data isn't changed. Um, sometimes the data can be changed when it's opened and closed. You want to make sure that that's not what's going to happen. That you're utilizing targeted data collection approaches to call your data population. So that you have things to limit the data to just what you're looking for, like custodians, date ranges, specific computers, file types, et cetera, and preserve the data to avoid spoliation claims. So usually it's good to have an initial copy, an exact copy made before you start going in to collect the data so that nobody says, oh, you deleted these files or you altered them. You can always point to the preserved copy that you have show that what you are are working with is an exact duplicate of what the original was sent to you. And then um, cost and scanning of these services, these are all estimates. These are things like can, hosting can be expensive, although that price has dropped down a lot over time. So you, but it, it can be a little pricey for ASP hosting. Um, scanning can be 12 cents to 14 cents per page or offsite, to maybe 15 to 18 cents on site if you consider the, the hourly rate of the person that you're having scan that information. OCR usually costs about four cents per page. Bait stamping is sometimes three cents per page. And objective coding can be um, $1.50 per, per document. Um, and then EDD processing, processing be 12 to 16 cents per page. So you can see that, that scanning and indexing and coding can mount up if you're talking a lot of paper and a lot of, lot of uh, files that you're working with. So again, if these things are already done ahead of time as part of business routine, these costs would be a lot substantially, substantially less. Um, so it's always important that you have continuous training and consulting because that gives you less ramp up time, to use the products, you know what the latest technology is, um, you can quickly train new hires and employees and you've got troubleshooting with them. Um, however, with a more powerful database tool becomes more training and more retraining of attorneys and secretaries for them to operate those features. You have to ask yourself, does your law firm have full-time professional trainers? You get your attorneys to attend training classes. That's a pretty important thing, um, especially nowadays. Um, you're able to provide those things online. That's so much better. And then these answers to these questions will help you decide whether uh, what database will be best for your best investment. You should try out different ones. I can't always just say, well, this database is going to work for every law firm perfectly all the time. I think it's important to 
fry out different databases, give them a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a shot, see what sort of routine you can get into where, where running a paperless office becomes the norm instead of the exception. And so if you're looking for hiring a trainer for your firm, you should know that the trainer knows the software that you're working on, that um, they've worked um, with other firms similar to your practice, they've worked on the current version of, of the software, um, can they get discounts or deals? And um, they have good style and ability to work with all members of your firm. Um, will the trainer be there for the long term? And um, can the trainer be there to consult with all the different offices that you have? So those are challenges that you need to consider when, when looking at somebody to help you get to your ultimate paperless office. Goal. So here's a, a list of some further resources. And that's the um, uh, presentation for today. Thank you very much for. Uh, uh, listening and uh, looking forward to uh, doing more presentations soon.